Welcome to the 11th episode of the Constitution of American Life at the Four Beats. With us, as always, is Professor James Michael Williams from the University of San Diego, Professor Tim Moore for the Center on the Study of the Constitution from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I want to make that clear. Uh, Professor Chris Cavanaugh from the Rough Riders State of North Dakota, and I am David Richmond coming to you from Oklahoma that got lost in California in the, Sa in the great San Joaquin Valley. I was doing some math today and I figured that we have collectively 150 years of studying the American Constitution and politics between the four of us. And as always, we have a lot to say or we have little to say many, many times. So it depends on how you, uh, you look at it. Today, we are going to discuss the executive branch in the Electoral College which in the words of uh, Professor Michael Genovese and David Adler was the best of several unappealing alternatives. Just let me say at the top of our discussion, the four Bs have spent significant time discussing the challenges of our constitutional structure and in the, in the top three of our list of problems, frustrations is federalism in the Senate. We don't wanna get, uh, Mr. Kavanaugh started on the Senate today, but, uh, and of course is the Electoral College. Uh, so uh, we are hoping to provide you some insights and uh, items to think about here in our discussion. Uh, and so I would like to start off with our historian, the man who works at the Center at the Study of the Constitution, and that is Professor Moore. Tim, the general perception and expl explanation that you will find in textbooks and talked about by teachers and professional development all over the place is that the framers chose the electoral college because they feared the people. Do you accept that explanation? Yes and no. Um, I think that is fair, uh, but I, we all know that that textbooks uh, have to boil fairly complicated things down into bite sized and understandable. Um, uh, you know, so so it, it yes, there there was a fear of the people, but there were some other fears that they talked about at Philadelphia as well. So it wasn't just their fear of the people. Um, one fear, I mean, because it seems like June and July, especially in July, they spent a lot of time um, sorting through all the variations. You know, have the national legislature do it, have the Senate do it, know the House should be involved, governor. Governors should do the selection. State legislatures should do the selection. Uh, so they were they were talked about a lot of things. And I would we'll put this in the resource section. Uh, the long train of all the comments that were made about the electoral college. But yes, they were fearful of the people um, not being smart enough to uh, to have a national vision or even be familiar with uh, candidates from other places. But they're also fearful of other things. And they're also, actually, they raise the issue of being fearful of foreign influence, which um, would the Senate or the House, if they were involved in selecting, would they be vulnerable to for, foreign intrigue and cabal? Um, so they were fearful of a lot of things, not just the people. Uh, well, I, I'm wondering to what extent this is related as well as sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna poke mr kavanaugh is, is this related to the uh to to slavery and the slave states and more importantly the separation of powers and the fear of giving the legislative branch all right uh control of selecting the president so i i concur that there's there's some element because we see it in other areas of the constitution but isn't this more so about separation of powers and to a degree federalism, i.e. fear of the slave states? Um, I don't, go ahead, Tim, because Tim wants to go here first. Well, no, yeah, there, is fed, there is a federalism component in their discussions before they get to the electoral college. And certainly there's a federalism component within the electoral college, but they were talking about federalism all through June and July. But there's, there's um, there's no discussion of how how uh, how it uh, intersects with slavery. It was all about big state, small state. Um, one suggestion was that we fix the number of a. Uh, they use the word electors, but they're using it differently throughout that summer. 
that we fix it at 25 and then we allocate it proportionately based upon population. So there, that generated a lot of discussion too. So there wasn't much discussion about how slavery would factor into this electoral system. Yeah, because I think of going back to the David question about slavery, I think we'd have to pull in the uh, three-fifths compromise uh, when you start talking about the population. And I think that's, that becomes a kind of a de facto uh, bias after the ratification in terms of giving an undue weight to the southern states within within the framework of the electoral college. So I'm not sure at the con convention, as Tim said, it was the debate about southern states and slavery, but afterward with the three-fifths compromise that you will see, I think it was Amar that once called it a slaveocracy. It creates a slaveocracy because of the three-fifths compromise along then with the electoral college because now you're looking at electoral votes you know linked to population and that population is also going to be linked to the three-fifths compromise well and i probably worded that wrong and i and I, I appreciate you guys correcting me it's not specifically about slavery but it is about political power and affirming and reinforcing the power that the slave states had already gained in 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 some of the deliberations in philadelphia would that be accurate well it um it depends on when um the the timing of the resolution of the three-fifths clause because and that's why i suspect that there's not any discussion about slavery as they're talking about um the the electoral college or uh, yeah when they're talking about the electoral college um to maybe circle back a little bit is there's a great fear because they talk a lot about for a substantive part of june and july about the senate being the mechanism or the upper house or, or they, they use different terms for what we would now call the senate and so one of the fears is aristocracy there uh, they are fearful of an aristocratic body being selecting and so you know the, morris is quite insistent that there ought to be some kind of popular mechanism um and then gary who's uh, recently off to shay's rebellion certainly is distrustful of the people being involved in elections so but there's a, a lot of their discussion about uh, the electoral college no matter what form they're talking about they're fearful of aristocracy uh, as well mm -hmm. Professor Williams, any uh, insights from the political science side of things? As it relates to the history or just more? Yeah, the well, as it relates to the just the general design here, like I said, you know, the, the, the general the population view is this is all about fear of democracy. And, and I'm as guilty as anybody of, of presenting that. Yet in, in my own close reading, you know, more recently is that it, it had maybe much more to do with separation of powers and eliminating the legislature from deciding who would be the the executive leader but it also had to do with the dynamics of the southern and northern states uh and we talked about this just in a very recent session of where i i believe that the the, the northern states or the so-called federalists not that they were all northern per se uh but that they folded yeah. It, when it came to, to slavery on this, and it was to reaffirm the the political power, the structure of 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 you know of the federal system and the southern states. Before I make my comment, can I ask Tim and Chris and you in those early elections, who were the electors? Who were the actual electors? It depended. Yeah. Was it well, they, could, they, they couldn't be members in any uh federal office. Uh and that, that could, was uh, they could be state elected officials, though, right? I I don't know from state to state. Uh, that may be the case. I don't know from state okay. to state. I because my two comments. I just wanted to check that fact. I I guess yeah. I, I agree with everything you just said, Dave. I agree with Chris and Tim on this. Um, I think it also kind of aligns with a general sort of um, checks and balances kind of thing that's on the mind of the framers. I I, I see them seeing the electors as kind of that check. I guess. Um, and then um i don't know you know we've talked about this in other episodes about um just how americans we didn't we definitely didn't want a king we didn't like nobles right but there is something about our culture that's kind of like we still like some of the um 
trappings of the monarchy. So I see the electoral college maybe as being going back to olden times where you had a group of nobles who would prop up, you know, someone to lead the country for a time being. And I know I don't know if that's a, the best sort of comparison or not, but I see these as a bunch of elites deciding what other elites going to lead, right? Whether those are elected officials or other folks. So. Well, you also have to remember too the as as these guys alluded to the electors are determined different ways depending on the state. These people, I'm not sure that you would the the, the people that become the original electors. I'm not sure that I would call them, you know, the elites in their state, right? Okay. They're not the political elite. They're the people that maybe through patronage or uh, connections or whatever it may be, may get this job knowing full well that there's an expectation of, uh, you know, loyalty, yeah. okay. right? There was, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, no, that's, I mean, so it's like, I understand what you're saying, Mike, but I'm not sure that the, the, the electors as they're originally determined in our first few batches of electors are, yeah. um, you know, uh, they're not, they may not be the powerful people within their states. When the delegates were talking about uh, like a smaller group doing the selection, um, there was this there was this notion. In fact, I think his name was uh, I think it was Williamson, a Southern delegate. He speculated that this uh, if we decentralize it into the states and have a states have a role in this, whether they be electors or whether the location, which is another thing I want to get back to the geography of this. He speculated that. I mean, he doubted whether they'd even be second or third rate individuals being, being involved in the electoral uh, in the electoral college. So I don't know that they felt decentralizing it to, you know, down to a state level electors would be the uh, political elites. And, and let me, Tim, let me ask you a question while I'm thinking about it. How much of this, too, was this debate over this method for practical purposes? Right. Sure. The idea that okay we're going to have a national election it's you know 17 is 1788 um how are we going to organize a for a one national office so is, yeah. is it simply also a logistical issue of like absolutely doing it that way? absolutely in fact uh that uh that's a good uh, that get gets me to my geographic point there was this um uh, you know, for a while they talked about maybe the electors showing up to the national capital and submitting their casting their ballots there. That was struck down because that really smacked of aristocratic, uh, you know, a cabal. So let's decentralize it. Uh, when we decentralize it in, out into the states, it's uh, foreign influence is, is harder if we decentralize it. Um, so there is a logistical um, motive geographically to put it out within the states. Uh, to your point, it's it's uh, just an efficiency issue. So, and that uh, that seemed to be fairly uh, apparent to everybody at Philadelphia. So, Professor Kavanaugh, um, is there any connective tissue between the design, the, the debate, and then the, the design of the Electoral College and the actual functions of the presidency? I mean, does this method of choosing uh, uh, the executive through this Electoral College have, have anything to do with the powers established in Article Two, and this is more of a question of curiosity on my part, and it might be a, just a really off-base question. I, I'm just curious if there's any connective tissue there. So the idea is that the the Electoral College, as it's established, actually would serve maybe on a check on the executive. Or... Well, if we look at it, that you know the House is selected by the people directly because that's their function. The mm -hmm. Senate is is initially elected by state legislatures to reflect their function. So right. I'm wondering if that's the same rationale uh, here, or do they deviate partly because of our first question that they're so afraid of a national election by the people? But you know, is there any kind of connective tissue, you know, between having electors do it rather than the people because of the power vested? in in the executive in article two i mean what do you what do you think or is that well, just I, such a wrong um, question you know and, and, and we're gonna maybe we should save that question for dr adler uh, because um the idea is is uh, uh you know are there spe what specific powers then and under the executive 
would um, you know would the electoral college serve as a check on right I'm not sure that there's that connective tissue it was more about how to get the guy in office I think but Tim well, go ahead. Did, yeah they did talk about I mean the easy one there is is foreign policy they didn't want the Senate involved in selecting because they would be involved in ratifying treaties so they wanted to take it away from the Senate for uh you know in other words there's an argument for an electoral college to do the selection because if it was the senate some president might be unduly influenced by the senate because he knows that's the group he has to come to with a treaty there's also some discussion at philadelphia about he has the power to appoint advisors that have to be approved by the senate so uh so there was some discussion at philadelphia to your question david about is there anything in the powers of the presidency that influenced their decision making for the electoral college and I, and I would recommend for students consideration yes there was treaties and uh his appointment power also this term of office plays into this do we want do we want uh the electoral college to pick for a seven-year term? most of the summer they were fine with a seven-year term and the committee I think it was a committee of style blindsides everybody because uh, everybody was fine with uh, a seven-year term and the <laughs> a seven year term in which they could be re-elected uh with no 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 real oh, okay so when this committee of style comes back and says let's go four and he's re-eligible uh you know <laughs> everybody there was like a whole day i think where they went ballistic on because they really challenged uh, wilson and Morris, like, what the hell did you guys do? I, you came back with uh, with a set of propositions that we hadn't even been talking about. So, and and the length of term played into whether we want an electoral college or whether we want uh, some other mechanism as well. And, and I apologize because it was probably a wacky question. It's just that it. it, it no, it's a great question. No, Tim just gave a heck of a lot better answer than I could. Yeah, it just it just seems to me, and I think Tim did a good job with it that a popularly elected executive who is going to be commander in chief and in control of foreign policy is a scary you know uh, uh possibility you know if it's popular again if it's popularly elected uh do we want the mob as we understand in the 18th century determining who's going to shape and carry out foreign and military policy uh, there so again getting back to something we've been touching on for weeks about madison's filters is the electoral college just another filter to try to make sure that demagoguery doesn't take hold of the office uh or you know i don't know did they use the term populism back in the 18th century i i don't no. think so right that uh, kind of stuff so they like, use the words uh, democratic spasms but they did use demagoguery didn't they oh sure yeah okay uh, yeah i just want to make sure i'm in the right uh, time zone uh, uh here historically mike i'm curious on an international perspective does any other country that you know of, as a, someone who teaches in the international relations field choose presidents even closer the way we do not anymore um in anticipation of this question um i looked up some countries and a few of the South American countries who have been known to sort of just copy and paste our constitution. So Argentina, Paraguay, and Chile, all for a period of time had an electoral college. They have all since abolished them. Um, Brazil's military used one for a while, actually. When <laughs> um, but no, I mean, most countries have either, either it's directly elected or it's a parliamentary system where the parties choose and the executive kind of comes out of the legislative branch and is still part of the legislative branch um the the, the country that has kind of come up with a mixed way to do this is um south africa where they basically have a parliamentary system so they they choose the head of state based on who has a majority in the parliament but when the parliament says um cyril, cyril ramaposa you are going to be president he then ceases to be a member of the parliament and they fill his seat with someone else and then every other cabinet member that becomes part of his government they separate out from the legislative branch so they have a they have a separated system like we do in terms of a separate executive branch unlike parliamentary systems but they um but they don't use the, the electoral college no 
we are going to pretend to, to be 17 uh, and have very little knowledge here of the parliamentary system. I am curious, in parliamentary systems, do they choose the head of the party, you know, before the election so everybody who's voting knows who is up for prime minister? Is that all done before or, or do they just choose the party and then the party can choose who the leader is? I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I mean, in the 20th century, everyone knows who the head of the party is. And everyone knows if that party gets power, the head of the party will be in, will be in control, either forming a coalition or leading the government. Mike, is that true for the 21st century as well? Oh, no. 20... <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Man, I don't know where my head is. I've, I've been listening to stuff today, and I've just been stuck in the late 20th century. So uh, 20th and 21st century. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, That's good. So, Tim, uh, in this question uh, that uh, Professor Genovese and uh, uh, Adler are, are quoted on, they, they talk about the, the, you know, the best of all our alternatives. I'm curious, that, that, that framing generation there, were they satisfied in, let's say, the next 20 years? Were they happy with that, uh, that decision they made in Philadelphia? Well, I'm sure when uh, when they got to the 31st ballot in the election of 1800, they weren't. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, obviously, there's some revision that takes place in the original uh, functioning of, of of how we elect the president. Um, but but bear in mind, they're they're trying to. Uh, it, it's interesting at the convention. Um, they talk about there's somebody mentioned we're trying to thread a needle in how we elect the president. Or we're trying. They there were several references to the Scylla and Charybd, which is uh, Greek mythology. You have uh, rocks on one side and a whirlpool on the other, and navigators have to, to uh, ship captains have to navigate between these two disastrous options. Uh, so I think for, in large part, I mean, before the, elect, before the election of 1800, I think everybody thinks that they struck the balance. I mean, I mean, one of the more bizarre things that came up late in the discussions was they, they had this, um, they came out of the Committee of Style where they said, uh, if, you know, if there wasn't a clear winner, uh, the Senate will take the top five vote getters and the Senate would pick. Well, then there's tremendous backlash on that because that smacks of aristocracy and insider uh, wheeling and dealing. Um, so th they're trying to thread the th they're trying to thread the needle of of democracy, uh, but yet this filtering representative system that uh, that the whole constitution sets up. Uh, so it, it's a it's a you know again it's a it's a bargain in federalism. There's a role for popular input. Uh, the number of the House representatives, and then there's a role for states. Each state gets two um, based on the Senate. So I think they were satisfied with the bargain because it's a federalism bargain. Okay, I could be having one of those, uh, you know, those uh, elderly moments uh, here, but I thought that either I read it or I heard it from one of you guys in an earlier discussion that there were early movements to amend the Constitution vis-a-vis -vis the Electoral College. Did I misread, mishear, or no. was there general dissatisfaction in that early republic or well, sure. general concern? Well, the anti-federalists raise it in ratification because they see it as, uh, as elitism, as aristocracy, and it wasn't in the spirit of the democratic uh, nature of the American Revolution. So yeah, I mean, uh, that, that occurs in the ratification debates, yes. Well, and, and even um, I remember, gosh, several years back, I think for the Nationals, they had a question uh, over the Electoral College. And um, one of my students had done some digging and found, uh, and I, I might have alluded to this before, a letter from Hamilton to um, Wilson, right? Yeah, so yeah from, yeah, from New York to Pennsylvania, worried about the flaws of the Electoral College and what could happen and actually opening the door for Adams. And so Hamilton himself alluded to in this letter to Wilson that he's already taken it upon himself to write to some people in other places to make sure that we're going to 
the, the make sure that Washington is going to get be a shoe in because we know there's a possibility that Adams could suck up some of the electoral votes. And um, so I think when they're presenting their arguments to the people uh, in their Federalist arguments in terms of why the Constitution is set up and, and to protect the, uh, uh, you know, the election of the executive, um, I think there was a real world concern that we know this may not actually work as well as we intended. Well, Chris, you know, you're hearing a very, very loud rumble, especially from the Democratic Party uh, today about uh, a need to abolish the Electoral uh, College. Uh, but, you know, we've had 64 presidential elections in our history, and three of those have gone the way that might bother people. That is, the popular vote went for one candidate but the electoral college vote went for another. Um, Are you including 1876 in there as well? I am including. Isn't that, uh, is, or is it now four times? I'm sorry, I may have miscounted there. So, uh, yeah, we have 1876, we have 2000, 2016, and- 1824. Oh, 1824, there's the one, okay. Yep, yep, elderly moment. So four uh, out so of four 60, how, how many, David, four do we have? Of, four out of 64, less than 10% of the time have we seen this uh, uh, going on. So I, I am just wondering from your perspective, has, has this rumble outside of the uh, founding framing period, the early Republic, so let's go from you know uh, uh, Lincoln on. Has there been, in your opinion, in your knowledge, a consistent rumbling about the Electoral College, or is this a modern uh, problem? Uh, in, in your sense, so a modern okay. concern. Um, I think it's a it's a probably a modern problem because more people are uh, aware of the situation. Um, I, I goes back to holy cow, my old senator Birch By in the seventies probably had gained some of the greatest momentum at one point for the abolition of the electoral college, um, and that was in I want to say the nineteen seventies. Um, so, but we we kind of moved away from that, and but and more recently because I mean, let's face it, two thousand and two thousand and sixteen, right? So that's two of the last what five five presidential elections that have not gone the way of the popular vote. So of course it's probably a more modern concern. So I mean, it's fresh. And you, and we mentioned earlier. You mentioned I think on a previous episode. You know, in, in the shelf life of politics, it's like, you know, things that happened three days ago are ancient history. But um, I think that it's a more modern concern. So, Mike, uh, you know, I read an op-ed today in which uh, the author said, get over it. You know, that, that given the fact that, that this happens so minimally in our political history, in which the Electoral College does not reflect the popular vote, uh, that this is much to do about nothing uh, kind of thing. And we just need that, especially the Democrats need to get over it. Uh, what would your response to that be? Well, my response would be like, first, that um, this structure is so misaligned with where our democratic sort of ethos and value is right now as a country. But I, I think we, we shouldn't just shrug our shoulders. I mean, this is something that's really not in alignment at all. And second, I think that if, if you get rid of the Electoral College, um, when you think about the way that then candidates are going to have to campaign and the ways that they are going to, to attract voters, I, I think we would see um, a different type of politics kind of emerge. I think that, that right now what candidates can do is they go to the the, the biggest states where those biggest prizes are and they're just counting those electoral votes. I think if you leave it up to, um, if you get rid of that system, I think it restructures maybe the way that candidates go about their business. So I think it matters. Well, okay, assuming, <laughs> assuming that there would be any chance whatsoever to reform this because by everything I understand, it would have to be an amendment. What would you suggest? What changes would you make to the system, Professor Williams? Uh, uh, what do you see as a better alternative in the 21st century uh, to this? You know, 
given the way we have kind of self-sorted and given the divides not only between north and south but the other kind of regional divisions um nigeria uh created this system in the 90s where they required their presidential candidates i think there are 36 states there they require their candidates to not only get 50 percent plus one of the vote but they must get at least i don't quote i need to look this up and i'll share it in the resources i think it's at least 25 percent of the vote from from the different states or something and, and what it what it's meant to do is it's meant for candidates to look for votes in places that they wouldn't other otherwise look for votes so other than just do a straight up or down um directly elected a president which i think would be a good first step i would want to do something a little more nuanced to think about how candidates can start um appealing to more than just their their one section of the electorate i think there are ways you could design a system to do that i don't think it's going to happen <laughs> but but i guess if you're asking what i'd want to do it'd be something like that well tim and chris i'm curious you know mike said that if if we you know if we we change that arrangement it changes you know there's this ripple effect it changes the politics of choosing a president but then he went on to say that you know right now they just campaign in the large states but mike they campaign in south carolina i mean a lot of money spent in and and, and again in in georgia i don't know if those are large states uh per se do you guys agree with mike that if we if we shifted this to a more popular more vote oriented system it would just unravel the current political strategies that exist i think i think it would um and, and I, uh, I'm not astute enough as to how that would ripple out, but I, I think, uh, you know, we're stuck. We're stuck with this state thing, and uh, <laughs> so our anybody who's watched these things, it's just an amazing thing how how prickly, a contentious uh, legacy we have in having to acknowledge the existence of states. So I, I've often wondered whether uh modifying the electoral college of having a national uh vote um i mean here's one option let's just let's just go with madison's virginia plan have the legislature pick it now at that time you can't do that because that's so british but aren't we at a point where okay maybe we should circle back and reconsider madison's proposal on the virginia plan another thought is okay let's take it away from two two votes per state based on their senators let's have a national vote popular vote and then have the governors so we're still paying some kind of credence to the states we're minimizing the role of states to some degree because we're not giving states two votes but now now we're only giving you one vote and it's the governor um so i and i i mean i'm there's all kinds of problems with that too but i i since we're brainstorming <laughs> well, well i'll, I'll that, propose that well that well, that is that, that is what we're doing chris go ahead well the only flaw i well not the only but one of the flaws <laughs> that i see there is the issue we have with the reality on the ground and that's gerrymandering you know so when you have these gerrymandered districts that limit the true reflection of the makeup of the state I mean, look at uh, most recently, look at the map that's just come out of Texas and you look at the percentages of people, then you look at the percentages of people reflected in the state legislature based upon the districts they've drawn, uh, that that becomes a struggle. Now, I've read this and I, I really can't remember who this was, so bear with me, but because um, I've, I've been a proponent of abolishing the Electoral College for a long time. I just don't think, I think it's inherently unfair um, and it's inherently flawed. Um, but gosh I, i'm trying to remember the and he was a political scientist and he talked about the idea that these presidents actually require them to campaign more in places where they don't traditionally go because they take these places for granted that with the winner take all system that we've alluded to before that they don't there's no need to because who, if i have the r before my name or the d before my name um i don't need to i don't need to worry about that but his contention was Actually, if you did away with the Electoral College, now you're going to have to come to places like North Dakota and reach out to the few hundred thousand people we have here. You're going to have to go to places that maybe are uh, were the flyover states before. 
Um, I think uh, another way to think about this too, if we want to, you know, for the traditionalists out there, what if we required, and again, this would take an amendment and back to the, the states, what if we required states, all states to be like Maine and Nebraska and go with proportional, right? So they have to divide up their electoral votes. That might be a, a, a simple fix. At least that'd be a little bit more representative of the will of the people. Would that take an amendment? It would, wouldn't it? Um, well, and it, no, it wouldn't. It would that would not take an amendment? You're right because states that would have to happen to in that. E, that would that would have to happen in each state legislature, right? Right. I think, uh, and, and for the students, are there any students in Colorado watching this? I think that you guys had considered this going into 2008, but one of the reasons that the people in the state of Colorado backed off from this is they liked the idea of being a swing state. They yeah. like the idea of having that juice in a national election, plus the fact that um, that so many dollars will come into a, a swing state. I mean, how many how many millions of dollars are dropped in Ohio during presidential elections, right? Um, yeah. So that Colorado backed well, away from dividing their electoral votes. And I guess that's my I'm going to be a little schizophrenic and push back a little bit on Dr. Williams. Mike, under the current system, they don't go to Vermont. They don't go to Rhode Island. They don't go to the Dakotas. Chris is never going to see, you know, a candidate running for president uh, coming to uh, his state. They don't go to Idaho. They don't go, you know. You know, so the small states are ignored under the electoral college system, you know, uh, and the small states are going to be ignored under the, uh, the 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 popular vote system. Am I correct? Yeah, no, I'm. I, I, you're right, and I think I may have misspoke what I was trying well, to say there. I, no, I don't. I don't. This is my point. I was trying to make is because when I talk with folks in, in you know North Dakota, you know, about this, they're like, "Well, no, we don't want to give up our power. So why should you have more power than the people of California?" Right. Why should Wyoming be more powerful? But this is the point. I, I wish I could remember the guy's name in the article. So but the idea was mathematically. He, the, the president's the candidates are still going to have to campaign in rural places if you do away with the Electoral College, because you can no longer take that uh, for granted and more people are in play. Right. More people are in play. And I think about and I don't know where this fits in our discussion, but I can't help but think of like um, in 2008. Senator McCain pretty much took Indiana for granted, right? Uh, did not have much of a ground game, did not much have a, a in terms of uh, offices and stuff, because it's like, hey, it's Indiana. We know Indiana is going to go for me. And Obama came in and had, oh my gosh, he had lots of smaller uh, offices set up and had a great ground, ground game in the state of Indiana and was able to get Indiana to go for him for the first time since 64. Uh, that and maybe the that's, last time. That's the that's the Hillary example in uh, Wisconsin in sixteen. I guess I guess I think you're right. I guess what I'm trying to say is that candidates know well before the election what the swing states are. Swing states are states yeah. that that there's a real competition over those electoral votes. If that wasn't the calculus anymore, then um, a Republican might come to California and might come to Central Valley, right, to really get get votes. A Democrat might go to Wyoming if there's go to a college campus there to see if they can get out an extra 10. I mean, it would change the way everyone's doing the math. I think I misspoke about who might benefit, but I think it would make the campaigning would be different. It wouldn't be those 12 to 13 or now with eight or nine purple states. We, it, the, the map would ex, would expand, I think. Yeah. And then the money would also be dispersed a little bit more you know, widespread. Because uh, again, you compare. I looked at a map of money spent in Ohio, uh, Wisconsin, Florida. Uh, you know these so-called uh, you know states that teeter, or you know, uh, uh, and uh, you know. So maybe the money would be dispersed. I mean, California doesn't get a lot of uh, money on presidential. People come to California for money to take it out to go spend in, in Wisconsin. <laughs> Thank and, you. And Thank you. Yeah, we're, yeah, Thank we're, you. Yeah, yeah. Talk about welfare uh, there. So th <laughs> th this, this is, you know, I, I think a branch of this, uh, you know, so it's not necessarily about the Electoral College, but it is about the, you know, the process of, of presidential elections. And you kind of alluded to it, Mike, and that is the, and, and Tim, that is the primary system. 
the primary system was supposed to make our our entire system much more democratic. In your opinion, gentlemen, has it done that? Has the primary system made our system more democratic, or is it just kind of shifted? You know, uh, again, who you know, in in smaller numbers, who makes decisions uh, uh, there? Where it used to be, as one one of you said, you know, old white guys in the back room with cigars. Uh, now it's a handful of states, really. It's it's Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina for the most part. Because if you don't survive those three states, you're eliminated. So I'm just curious about you know your sense of the primary system because it is part of the electoral uh, system uh, 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 in many ways. So thoughts about that? My initial response, and I'll let Mike clean up. <laughs> My initial response is it's not so much the uh, the primary system is I think the de the the defanging of the importance of parties. Uh, has is is the bigger problem rather than the primary system um you know if if people aren't beholden to the to the major party and kind of kind of run independent of it i think that's the bigger problem uh than the actual primary as in general well i i i would disagree with that tim i think it's um the and to go back to i hate to keep like beating a dead horse to death here from the department of redundancy department but um <laughs> is the gerrymandering issue because the, the, we have so many safe districts you know mm -hmm. created and you know we've all heard the adage that it used to be people pick their candidates now candidates pick their voters right voters pick the candidates now candidates pick the voters by drawing the lines at the state level and so you create these safe districts knowing full well that there if you have an r mm -hmm. or a d the, the, whoever has that is going to win that seat right and this is so in the primary system now you're worried about being primaried from a more extreme position. You know, your flank is exposed by someone more extreme, uh, either to the left or to the right uh, within your party, because the district has been drawn so safe that whoever is the Republican or Democratic candidate within that district is going to win. So that primary system in that regard, I think, is, uh, is flawed and should be restructured in conjunction with uh, the gerrymandering issue. Yeah, I would say two things. I would say, um, first of all, because political parties are not part of the Constitution, they're just, they're private associations. So they, they regulating them is really hard. So there's a, we all know, maybe the students don't know, there's a lot of politics over the fact that New Hampshire is the first primary and Iowa is the first caucus. And that just all has, I mean, if we had a more centralized electoral system, those decisions would not be made by the individual parties and the states we would say okay all the elections are going to happen on this day and it, it would get rid of this like oh so new hampshire and iowa and south carolina they're they're choosing our our guy this year or our, our woman um so that's the first thing the second thing is is it more democratic like before there were primaries it was it was people in back rooms deciding yeah i mean my definition of democracy in terms of allowing people more of a say primaries make it more democratic i think there's only the potential, though, of a, m m being more democratic, because what we see now is that now we have this <laughs> we have this system in place that's misaligned with our values. We're not that democratic of a people, small d. Like, not a lot of us come out for the primaries, and that's our own fault. I mean, the fact that 10 percent of the folks in Iowa or New Hampshire are going to are going to determine maybe who the candidate is when that primary or caucus is open to everybody and people choose not to participate because they're they don't want to go outside or they're it's too cold or they don't care or they don't think it's going to matter that's on us as a people i mean that the primaries have the potential of being really democratic and really getting candidates that reflect who the people want but the way they operate just like the way our elections operate right we all know this in terms of other industrialized nations we don't participate like we just we're our what we are doing with our behavior um, is misaligned with our opportunities in the structure. Mike, let me ask you a question, and 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 certainly, you know, in terms of like, you, as several of you, or you guys have pointed out that the order of the primaries, right? And and how much of a role um, does our modern journalism play in this, and the idea of the coverage, the media coverage, and this horse race mentality of 
the front runner is going to get the coverage because yeah. the front runner is going to get the coverage. The front runner is going to be able to raise money. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think for students watching something else to consider in our primary discussion is what is the role of the media within this driving it? You're right, Chris. I mean, and the media is like, think back to the election of um, 1960, right? We all know that the most important primary in 1960 for um, JFK was, was West Virginia, right? He, he had to prove that he could win a democratic state that was not Catholic. And it, so it didn't, he, he dropped out of it. Like he didn't even, he didn't even primary most of the other states. After he won that one, he was like, all right, I've proved to the party I can do this, let's go. Um, and you're right, the mentality now is, we're already thinking about the primaries for, <laughs> for the next election and the media is juicing us up, right? To just think that what happens in New Hampshire and Iowa is gonna be the end of the story. Yeah. But wouldn't that be eliminated if the party, I, I guess I'd want to go back pre-Jackson, wouldn't that be eliminated if the backroom deals where the party elite said, you are running, not you? Uh, so, so wouldn't the media, in a sense, have to live with party decisions if it was, uh, you know, if parties took back control of, I mean, still have primaries, I guess. Well, but before that be, before things? well before you guys answer this, Tim again, man, my my curiosity radar. Uh, early, how was this decided in the first? You know, in the late night, late eighteenth, early nineteenth. We know it's well. I don't know about the late eighteenth, but we know by the age of Jackson, it's it's these so called party leaders. But how was it decided? I mean, how did they, you know, based on your historical understanding, how was were these decisions made? If you wanted to run in New York, you had to have the blessing of George Clinton. There were political machines, and the political uh, the state, state state political figures determined a lot of who would run. Well, uh, then how did how did the parties create a national? Well, that's that's yeah. the argument that we don't truly have national parties till Martin Van Buren. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Martin Van Buren always makes me chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> well, as he should, as he should. Fair enough. Uh, so there, there is this, there is this school of thinking that we didn't have national parties until uh, until Jackson and and then national parties until Van Buren, right? Well, do me a favor, draw this picture for, for students who, and again, my sense of it is, you know, just because of, of the reality of the time we live in, is, is most young people have no idea about the history of politics there. So draw a picture for kids of how a national candidate, like, I mean, how is Lincoln chosen? I know he was ultimately chosen as a, at a convention, correct? Uh, there, but if, whether it's Lincoln or whether it's Buchanan or whatever, can you draw a picture for kids of how this worked before the modern era of primaries? And Chris, I, jump in too. Well, please, Chris, jump in. I have well, no idea. You're, you're <laughs> well, I mean, David, you hit the point of terms of national conventions, right? And then you get into the regionalness of these national conventions, multiple ballots to get delegates. There, there, there is where your backroom deals are made at national conventions with local power brokers. You know, when I say local, I mean state power brokers showing up with vested interests in certain people. Um, and so those are where a lot of your backroom deals will be made because then these people at the national convention can throw their weight or their power saying, okay, we're shifting, right? We're shifting our delegates to a certain candidate. Um, so I think the national conventions have done that, but as the, we've moved away from that because of our current system, and by the time we have a national convention, it's, you know, so anticlimactic. Um, it's, you know, the only thing that I can think of in terms of the convention to me in the, in the most of my recent memory of something that is truly something uh, groundbreaking in our nation's history was in 2008. At the Democratic National Convention, when you had a woman candidate, female candidate, Hillary Clinton, withdraw her nomination and give her delegates to an African American candidate. And so, in terms of the National Convention having any kind of like coolness to it or drama to it, to me, that's well, the most recent one where 
that was that was just a and, and i'm not talking about we, i don't care which way your twig has been politically but to have a, a a viable female candidate give her delegates to a viable african-american candidate for the presidency was pretty historical and that was decided in some back room wasn't it well no i think that i think that was pretty much that uh, uh secretary senator clinton had seen the writing on the wall and knew that she was not going to win so they yeah knew but you can and plus you know they actually did something that the Democrats usually aren't very good at, and that's getting in line. One thing <laughs> the Republicans tend to be pretty good at is getting in line. The Democrats, not so much. But I think that was also a question of getting in line, knowing that you probably are not, you're not going to, how many ballots are we going to go through at this convention for you to understand that you're not going to get the requisite number of delegates? I am curious. The, the uh, convention of 1860, wasn't that in Chicago? Uh, yes, I think it was. So how much role did that play in Lincoln getting the nomination? Uh, well, remember, he's still got Stephen Douglas rumbling around. I know, but but I, I, I'm i thinking of Dolores Kearns Goodwin book early on, you know, and I think it's her book. I'm trying to remember which book it was. Yeah. This is quite yeah. a, an unruly convention. All right, and going into it, Lincoln's not favored. Now, and well, but it's easy for it's easy for uh, Republicans from the East Coast to get behind Lincoln because he's uh, they know he's a Whig it, way back in the day, and so the Whig agenda of internal improvements, westward expansion, a uh, slow westward expansion. So th there's a lot in Lincoln's po early formative political life that East Coast Republicans can jump onto. So I don't know that. I don't know that the, the the Chicago, it being in Illinois, uh, is going to give Lincoln an advantage in Chicago. I think the East Coast industrialists can can get behind a former Whig. Yeah, Mike? I have to. I got to jump in here. Sorry, Mike. And the fact that the Free Soil Party was <laughs> was not for the uh, the extension of slavery into the newly acquired territories. Right. Right. Which, and which the East Coasters can get behind as well, because yep. they don't want that balance of power to tip in the Senate. Right? Fair enough. Fair so, enough. You got your free soilers in there, Chris. Good job. Excellent. <laughs> Here's a biscuit. Now go away. Dr. Williams. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've, I've forgotten most of what I learned from Team of Rivals. But it, what I wanted to point out to the students is that um, in an earlier episode, we talked about cult of personalities. And I think you can think of the convention as, you know, Lincoln walking in, Seward walking in. And they have their people with them. And these are folks that have a history with them. They're gonna be loyal to this person because this person, they're gonna get a job in that administration or they're gonna benefit. And the conventions were about brokering coalitions to get your person in, right? Really not democratic at all. So that's how it worked. Fast forward to the 1970s, the system that was set up with primaries was supposed to be, all right, all right let's give that power to the people of the states, right? Let's let them have a choice. But all of a sudden, we are a, a huge country, um, candidates trying to get their name out there. So who become, who become the equivalent of, of, of those people behind the scenes? It's, it's people with money who can then provide the necessary funding for the advertising so people can get their name out there, right? And then the fast forward to 2020, um, Candidates have been trying to do this since the early 1990s. Like, you know, Howard Dean was the first one I think that said, I'll take money, like I'll take a, I'll take money like donations through my, through like electronic things. Um, I'm not thinking of what I'm trying to say. Obama used um, text messaging. Well, Donald Trump as a candidate used Twitter to go directly to the people, right? So, and he, and he had a heck of a lot of money. Like he didn't have to take money. So that combination of someone who can finance um, their own campaign and then going directly to the people, maybe that's about as democratic as it gets in terms of a small D Democrat. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are now wrestling with, did we get the kind of candidate that the founders were very afraid of in the 1780s, right? It's, it's someone who can appeal directly to the masses they don't have to worry about the, the parties or any sort of factions because they have the money to cut through that. Um, is that what democracy looks like with a small D sense? And is that why we, 
we were we were meant to be a republic <laughs> and not a democracy in the first place. Sorry, I went a long ways there, but I just kind of saw how that connected together. Not a well, problem. In, 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 fed, in Federalist, I think it's 68, Chris, can you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. There, there is this interesting couple of sentences where Hamilton is arguing that the Electoral College is, is all that in a bag of chips because they'll be virtuous. Uh, they'll, they'll kind of be the better the sort. Best. And these and these electors will see through, uh, you know, chicanery and some some Yahoo that comes along and wants to, uh, you know, hoodwink everybody. These electors will be those gatekeepers to, to Mike's point. Now, interesting uh, that uh, how, how that plays out, you know, uh, in Actually, Tim, I think that was the quote that was in the Nationals question that I alluded to earlier. From Fed 68 with yeah, Hamilton, right. talking the about virtuous the electors, virtuous electors, they'll be able to spot the demagogues that they've talked yep. about earlier and all this right. kind of stuff. So, yeah, and and him knowing full well, eh, I'm not really sure about this. Yeah, he, thing. <laughs> he's involved in trying to monkey around in the system. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I do believe that the electoral college, the whole selection of the the, the, the executive branch, the president, uh, need some major massaging slash reform. And in closing, I came across uh, in, in, in a lot of reading I did this last week of a, an article that said the solution, and it being from, from California, it bothers me tremendously that Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina are the first three. All right, all three very small states. South Carolina, I, you know, I guess we'll call it diverse. Uh, uh, there, but uh, it doesn't come close to Texas, Florida, uh, California, and some other states as far as diversity uh, goes uh, there. Uh, and this author advocated a quartile system, is that we have four Super Tuesdays. We have regional Super Tuesdays. We have a New England, Mid-Atlantic Super Tuesday. Then we have a Southern States, you know, Super Tuesday. And then a Midwest and Mountain West Super Tuesday, and then a Pacific Coast, uh, Alaska, Hawaii Super uh, Tuesday. And I thought that was that that's one of the most insightful and brilliant uh, ideas when it comes to the way we choose the president that that I've seen uh, uh, there. Uh, I'm sure there's are disadvantages, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's in some ways, uh, and, and, you know, uh, now the and the order would rotate. Uh, each election year. So it's not always New England, Mid-Atlantic that starts off kind of thing. Uh, so uh, we've gone to a lot of different directions uh, uh, here. Uh, the Electoral College is somewhat of a narrow topic uh, to deal with. We've hoping, uh, we've, we are hoping that we've given you uh, something to gnaw on and think about uh, as you uh, prepare for uh, uh, your hearings. Uh, the next session, we're going to be uh, meeting with a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, friend of uh, the four Bs and, uh, 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 again, one of the best scholars when it comes to the institutions of government, and that is Professor David Adler uh, from the great state of uh, Idaho. So we hope that we'll see you there. We're going to be talking about the judiciary ban branch and judicial review. Until that uh, same bat time and same bat place, peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Bye, 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 bye.